Okay, we are uh, very pleased to have Michael Tallman today from Oklahoma U uh, State University, and uh, he will speak about uh, characterization of calculus one final exams in US colleges and universities. Thank you, Mahdi. And thank you all for, uh, for the invitation to share with you uh, in the seminar. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And I hope um, that uh, this title slide is visible to everybody and that uh, you can all hear me clearly. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, as Madi mentioned, I'm uh, in the Department of Mathematics at Oklahoma State University. Um, one of my primary responsibilities um, is coordinating are uh, Calculus One courses at Oklahoma State. And I've been, um, that's been a part of my position uh, for several years now. And so I've worked to try to integrate my scholarly interest in mathematics education with curriculum design uh, and assessment design in calculus. Um, sort of use our calculus program as a, a context for research as well as an outlet for the kinds of innovations that result from uh, my research program. So I'm gonna share some of this with you today. Uh, half of the presentation is going to be a discussion of research that I and my colleagues have done on characterizing calculus assessments um, to try to abstract principles of effective assessment design. But most of this I'm, I'm hoping will be a rather pragmatic presentation in the sense of trying to convey and illustrate um, some of these practices and principles that you might consider um, for whatever uh, courses you might teach or whatever assessments you might develop. And as I proceed through this, do feel free. Uh, I, I, I don't want to uh, break any norms of your seminar, but if there are questions throughout, um, please do feel free to stop me uh, and, and interject a question uh, as you have them. So I would like to... Um, uh, quickly acknowledge the, uh, the help and support of my collaborators in, in this research program. Zachary Reed, who's a faculty at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, uh, my colleague Michael Ortman here at Oklahoma State, and Marilyn Carlson at Arizona State University. So as I suggested a moment ago, um, half the presentation is going to focus on research design and results, and the other half will, will be a, a, an illustration of some of the the principles and practices and recommendations that have come from the research. But I'm going to start by just sort of situating the relevance of my work in the context of uh, the national, national situation relative to Calculus One at post-secondary institutions in the US. Discuss some research design, uh, including uh, experimental and analytical methods, um, relevant theoretical perspectives, summarize the results of of this research, uh, but then really spend most of the time talking about features of exam items that assess understanding and then demonstrate suggestions for designing conceptually focused assessment items with several examples from Calculus One uh, topics. And then uh, kind of at the conclusion, I was mentioning this a moment ago, is discuss some more effort, recent efforts that myself and my colleagues have been engaged in uh, with using technology in formative assessments of students' learning in the context of, of single variable calculus. Several of you may be um, aware of, perhaps have read uh, this uh, MAA publication summarizing the results of the um, CSPCC study, the Characteristics of Successful Programs in College Calculus. Uh, this is the NSF funded project that supported uh, my initial work in the uh, analysis of calculus assessment. And this is a, a, a great open uh, publicly available resource. Uh, and in this, uh, this document, um, there's a lot of information about the, the actual results of that study, um, quantitative and qualitative results. There's case studies of, of exemplary institutions, but also a lot of descriptive data about 
um, calculus students in the US, their majors, retention rates, so on. And one of the interesting um, uh, pieces of information relative to uh, um, students' majors in, in calculus is that the vast majority of students enrolled in, in calculus at post-secondary institutions are pursuing either engineering, biological or health sciences, or um, a, a, a math or physical science major. So, um, and actually quite a small percent um, are, uh, are, are students who intend to major in mathematics, only 2%. Um, so calculus uh, obviously serves uh, a, a really important role within STEM programs, particularly in the engineering, computer science, biological science, and physical sciences. But retention rates um, and, and pass rates uh, in Calc 1 are, uh, they demonstrate a real need for improving instruction, uh, assessment, and curricula, um, particularly at the college level. So this is just showing here um, the, uh, the, the grade distributions of Calculus 1 uh, students or a sample of Calculus 1 students um, at different classifications of post-secondary institutions. And although the, the D, uh, the DWF rate, so these are students who, who receive a D in the course, withdraw from the course, or receive an F in the course, um, is around, you know, between, uh, between 25 and, and, you know, 37%, 38%, or, or you know, between 22 and 38%, depending on the type of institution. Um, but Calculus 1 is, obviously one of a series of mathematics courses that students in these STEM disciplines have to take to complete their degrees. So obviously you know, engineering students, most of these students have to take the entire calculus sequence, um, differential equations, linear algebra. Uh, so even though the DWF rate uh, is you know, around a fourth, a third or a fourth, um, if students receive below a B in calculus one, their chances of completing their STEM degrees is drastically reduced. Uh, and that's about, about 50% of students enrolled in Calculus One are getting a C or lower, um, which is again, cause for concern. Uh, if we contrast that with students' expectations, 93% of students expect at least a B in Calculus, or at least the, the large number of students surveyed. 27% uh, there's a 27% overall uh, draw, uh, DWF rate um, across all classifications of institutions. And it's also um, concerning that 33% of students in Calc 1 who require Calc 2 for their major don't persist and actually enroll in Calc 2. This is not a completion rate. This is simply an enrollment rate. Students, 33% never even enroll uh, in second semester calculus. And students also um, report voluntarily leaving STEM disciplines because of dissatisfaction with classroom culture and their mathematics courses. And so, again, collectively, the, 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 you know, these data indicate that um, there's a need for improvement uh, in, in undergraduate calculus. So considering that context, why analyze exams? Um, what's the relevance of exams you know, in, in, in potentially addressing some of these concerns? Well, I think that summative assessments, um, although imperfect indications, they do reflect instructional priorities and commitments. They can suggest pedagogical approaches and reveal norms and practices that can kind of provide a holistic uh, image of what's emphasized in collegiate calculus, uh, what um, types of understandings are students uh, expected to be proficient in or demonstrate understanding of, uh, what kind of skills, um, and what proportion of understanding versus skills uh, are represented on summative assessments. So the, the question that my colleagues and I considered for this particular study was simply what meanings are assessed on final exams from single variable calculus courses at, at US post-secondary institutions. Our previous research focused on 
characterizing simply the cognitive demand of assessment items. But in this project, we were more interested about characterizing the specific conceptions of calculus ideas that, uh, that students um, th that are required to successfully answer uh, assessment items from a large sample of final exams uh, in Calc 1 courses. So our data set consisted of 254 exams um, that were provided by institutions that were surveyed. These exams um, collectively comprised of 4,167 individual items. And most of these exams uh, were provided by um, institutions that meet the classification of, of national universities. Uh, or at least are classified by U.S. News and World, and World Report as national universities. But all different types of institutions were represented in our data set, including regional universities, national liberal arts colleges, community colleges, regional colleges, um, and so on. So we analyzed this large sample of, uh, of assessment items by first identifying items that assess understanding. Now this is really challenging because determining whether an item assesses understanding first requires describing what it means to understand a mathematical idea. But understanding is also relative to the experiences of the person engaged in a task. So any task can be proceduralized. Um, we had to rely on our, our uh, understanding of the kinds of tasks, experiences that are made routine in calculus courses versus those that tend not to be. Um, you could take what seems like a rather uh, procedural task and give it to a student who hasn't yet thought about the procedure for that task. So take, for example, this is not in a calculus context, but given a constant rate of change, given that y varies at a constant rate of 7.3 with respect to x, um, if the value of y uh, is 10.5 when x is 2.1, what's the value of y when x is 17.9? Right? So in other words, determining a value of y um, given a constant rate of change and then a point on the graph of a linear function. Well, if students don't know point slope or slope intercept form of a linear equation, that's a rather conceptual question because it requires uh, leveraging an understanding of constant rate of change as a multiplicative relationship between corresponding changes in X and Y, right? That's a very conceptual item. But if students, have, if, if the intention for that kind of question is for students simply to apply point slope uh, form of a linear equation, um, then it's, it's a rather routine and therefore procedural. So this is, this is part of the difficulty in identifying items that assess understanding is that it relies so much on, on the prior experiences of the student. Uh, and I'll address how we, uh, how we uh, accommodated for that in a moment. The second phase of our analysis was to then characterize the meanings that these items assess and the ways of reasoning they require. So to the first um, phase of our analysis, right? after several iterations of constructing definitions of what it means for uh, an assessment item to actually evaluate understanding, attempting some coding, and then having to revise to accommodate for borderline cases, we eventually uh, settled on this operational definition of what it means for an assessment item to actually assess understanding. A task assesses understanding if the most plausible reasoning students would employ to construct a correct response requires them to coordinate interpretations, provide explanations or justifications, make comparisons, draw inferences, or make strategic decisions that result from assimilating the task to a figurative or operative scheme for the idea. Now, uh, you'll notice this definition relies on our interpretation of the most plausible reasoning, um, but also references some ideas within um, constructivist epistemology or Piaget's genetic epistemology, this reference to figurative or operative schemes. So what is that? So Piaget distinguished between different kinds of cognitive structures. Um, action schemes, which are enacted based on one's recognition of a stimulus as being of a particular type 
and the assimilation of the stimulus is enough for the activation and execution of the scheme. Figurative and operative schemes are not enacted by merely perceiving stimuli and classifying them um, uh, to, to, to enact the scheme. They require, the, the enactment of a figurative or operative scheme requires interpretation. Um, it requires much of what's referenced in this definition. Right? So I'm not gonna get too much into the, um, the epistemology of these distinctions, but the, the reference to figurative or operative schemes in this definition is to contrast it with action schemes. And the, 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 the potential for the cognitive structure to be enacted by recognizing surface level features of problem statements that serve as cues to enact the rehearsed procedure. Um, we also characterized, as I mentioned a moment ago, the, the meanings that the, uh, the items assessed and the ways of reasoning they require. So let me very quickly talk about two important ways of reasoning that are essential to students' calculus learning um, that we've we focused rather heavily on in our analysis. Uh, the first is quantitative reasoning. Now, quantitative reasoning uh, is sort of an elaborate theoretical perspective within mathematics education that describes ways of thinking about measurable attributes and relationships between measurable attributes and their relation to mathematical representations, including uh, function definitions, graphical representations, uh, and operations on these objects. The quantitative reasoning is a characterization of the mental activity involved in conceptualizing situations in terms of quantities and quantitative relationships. And so quantities, that, that's not synonymous with number. Um, in this definition. A quantity is a measurable attribute of a real or conceptual object. So function values can be conceptualized quantitatively as, um, or at least when reasoning graphically as directed magnitudes, uh, uh, vertical magnitudes uh, from a horizontal axis. Um, quantitative relationships are relationships between quantities. Constructing quantitative relationships and analyzing a situation in terms of quantities and quantitative relationships is, uh, is called constructing a quantitative structure. And I'll demonstrate this with some of the uh, assessment items that I contrast here in a moment. Right. A similar form of reasoning is covariational reasoning. Covariational reasoning is simply reasoning about the simultaneous variation of quantities, essential in calculus. So it refers to the mental actions involved in coordinating the values of two quantities while attending to how they change in relation to each other. Okay, um, as I mentioned a moment ago, I'm going to very briefly convey at a rather high level what the results, the, some of the main findings of this research are, but then uh, get into some details about how we see um, some important distinctions in the meanings items assessed uh, by looking at particular examples. So. Based on our phase one analysis, we, we determined that approximately 20% of the 1,467 exam items in our sample satisfied the, uh, the criteria I just mentioned for assessing understanding. And we then characterized the meanings assessed by items within the following groups. Right? So um, not surprisingly, these groups sort of reflect uh, various topics within the, the, the Calculus One curriculum. Um, and then we analyzed items within each group to try to, uh, to abstract the particular ways of understanding um, that were common or, or prioritized within assessment items within each group. Okay. Oops. Uh, we also found that there were very few items in the sample that required students to engage in the following constructive processes. First, coordinate two dynamic processes while evaluating limits. This means attending to the simultaneous variation of the controlling variable with the variation in the expression uh, being evaluated. Conceptualized rate of change is a multiplicative comparison of changes in covarying quantities measures. In other words, it's a proportional relationship between a change in, in, in input and output quantities. Construct quantitative operations while reasoning about related rate and applied optimization problems. I'll demonstrate that with a couple of examples in a moment. Comprehend 
the context described by these problems dynamically. Uh, in other words, the, 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 the requirement to model some applied context um, being uh, contingent on a student's dynamic conception of that context. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that by contrasting a couple of optimization problems. Additionally, very few items required students to interpret rates of change and context beyond kinematics. Interpret symbolic expressions as representing quantitative structures, particularly with reference to the definition of derivative and, uh, and Riemann sums. It's constructing a quantitative conception of the product structure of Riemann sums and indefinite intervals. Comprehend the relationship between accumulation and rate of change expressed in the fundamental theorem of calculus, again, outside of kinematic context. Um, so also based on this analysis, we abstracted the following features of items that assess understanding. I'm not going to read these um, because in the, the problems I, I'm about to discuss, I'll, I'll use them to illustrate uh, these various features. Likewise, for these suggestions uh, of, of uh, suggestions for exam items that, that assess understanding. So these are suggestions for instructors. Um, who, who might be developing a, an assessment item. Um, and again, I'm not going to read these, but I will, I will try to demonstrate each of these suggestions with particular questions. So what's very interesting to us in our analysis is that um, there were many situations when we would have uh, items within it, one, of the, one of the categories that we, uh, uh, that we constructed. Um, and the items would on the surface look very similar. Uh, I'm not suggesting that these two questions are an example of this kind of thing, but uh, once we unpack the ways of, of understanding required to, to successfully respond to the question uh, and the ways of thinking involved, there were important distinctions um, and even very slight characteristics of questions that required uh, students to demonstrate deeper levels of understanding. We try to make those explicit in the suggestions that I, uh, that I had on the previous slide, um, which again, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll demonstrate with, with particular questions. So here, uh, th th these are two, two questions within sort of the tangent line group. Um, find the point on the graph of, a, of, of the exponential function e to the x where its tangent line passes through the origin versus What's the slope of the line tangent to the graph of sine at pi over two? Now, of course, there are particular interpretations of both of these questions that, that could uh, events understanding. Okay? Students could conceptualize sine x as um, a vertical distance above the horizontal diameter of a circle with an angle's measure with, it, with an angle oriented in standard position and recognize that that vertical distance uh, varies um, at the rate of change of that vertical magnitude is zero as the angles measure uh, is pi over two radians, um, or could enact a standard you know, uh, procedure for solving this problem. And we consider the latter to be the intention. But if we contrast these two items, we see here that the, the first one um, is a variation of the standard sort of compute the slope of the tangent line problem. In this first problem, Constructing a correct solution requires the students to conceive of the two points determining a slope, which they that can then compute with the explicit goal of equating the derivative with the, uh, uh, um, the slope of the line that, that passes through the origin. So what's crucial about this is that the differentiation is purposeful and is motivated by a geometric conception of what a derivative represents. And these kinds of inferences and strategic decisions are not required by the second question. So I interpret that first question as an example of, uh, of an assessment item that contains particular novelties and nuances that require students to make strategic decisions and also to draw inferences based on a particular feature of the problem. So there's this, this slight twist that makes it non-standard, but makes it non-standard in a way that, that requires these kinds of strategic decisions and inferences. Here's an example of, a, of one of the assessment uh, questions from the discontinuities, limits and discontinuities category. So this three-part question asks students to 
determine the values of these uh, these constants in um, in the the definition of this rational function to satisfy various criteria, uh, and these are different values of a, b, and c for each of the three parts of this problem. So first. Uh, what values of A, B, C, and D uh, uh, make the function have a removable discontinuity at one? Uh, or for the second question, a vertical asymptote at three? And for the third question, make the limit as X approaches D equal to four, right? And students have to be able to apply their understanding of the criteria for these different kinds of discontinuities um, and, and determine the values of these constants purposefully. Uh, this is, quite different from uh, you know, questions that will simply provide a rational function and maybe ask students to classify discontinuities. Um, and students could then simply sort of rely on memorized criteria for when a discontinuity is removable versus when, you know, uh, when um, there's a, a vertical asymptote, that sort of thing. Right? So there's just something non-standard about this that can disrupt the student's uncritical application of a rehearsed action scheme. And if a student answers that question correctly, it fulfills what is an essential uh, purpose of an assessment item, which is to enable an instructor to reliably infer that the student possesses the intended meaning. Um, and very obviously that last question did prompt the students to explain and justify their reasoning. Now, most related rate problems, because they require uh, a, uh, a often very extensive um, series of steps to, to solve, most of them require understanding. Now, only the most basic ones uh, or very highly scaffolded related rate questions don't require understanding. So both of the items I'm about to share, uh, we, we classified both of these as requiring understanding. and I. Um, I put these animations in to, to, uh, to illustrate this. So this is the first question, you know, quite standard. Um, a sphere is changing in size. Um, how fast is the radius of the balloon changing at a particular moment? And so given the context here, um, students have to either recall or be provided with the formula for the volume of a sphere and it then sort of proceeds rather, uh, rather predictably. You know, uh, compute the, the derivative, take the derivative of both sides of the equation with respect to elapsed time, um, plug in the known values to solve for the requested rate of change. Again, this does require understanding because of the, 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 the coordination of multiple procedures um, uh, involved in, in, in this solution. But a question like this, uh, with you know, a situation where somebody is running around uh, the bases of a, of a baseball field, and students being prompted to determine the rate at which the base, uh, the the runner's distance from home plate is changing at a particular moment, right? the students have to conceptualize the context dynamically and model the situation with a formula that isn't immediately obvious, right? So of course, there's a this is a question that involves using the Pythagorean theorem to model the situation. Um, most related rate problems, as, as I'm sure we all know, uh, most related rate problems in standard calculus curricula require modeling a context with the Pythagorean theorem. But in this instance, the student has to make that inference. Whereas in the previous problem, um, recognizing that the, the quantity uh, the, the, the quantity whose rate of change is requested is explicitly referenced um, and that they're dealing with a standard geometric object, a sphere in that instance, doesn't problematize the modeling aspect of the, of the situation, uh, whereas as, as this one does. Again, both require understanding, um, but the, the, the solution process that's enacted in the second example has to be implemented more purposefully and with an understanding of, of actually what, uh, what they're trying to accomplish. Right? So again, all related rate problems because of their complexity tend to, tend to assess understanding. But I view the second example as a more compelling, uh, as a more compelling uh, example of a problem that requires students to invoke and or coordinate multiple procedures 
um, compare the results of multiple actions, uh, and especially engage, engage in modeling. Uh, by making an interpretation, by actually envisioning the context, interpreting quantities within the context, defining quantities, and expressing relationships between them. This is a situation where the quantitative reasoning requirements are far more extensive. This is also a situation that demonstrates, I think, two suggestions for, uh, for writing uh, conceptually focused exam items that, uh, that we abstracted from our analysis. Uh, the, fir the, the first is that the, the, the second of these two related rate problems engages students in goal-oriented activity that doesn't explicitly reference the solution method or scaffold steps in a multi-stage process. The first didn't really either, but it was the, the fact that the appropriate formula to, to, to differentiate with respect to elapsed time was far uh, more obvious in the first problem than the second. Um, and so the second one, I had this increased demand of requiring the student to um, uh, make multiple unreferenced strategic decisions and coordinations of, of multiple actions. Uh, it's also interesting with related rate problems in particular, uh, and this is from our analysis of the, uh, of the data set of just related rate items, that the vast majority of related rate problems on the, uh, the four, uh, however many hundred of exams we had, the vast majority of related rate problems were expected to be modeled using the Pythagorean theorem. Well, about, I say majority, about half, about half, uh, far more than any individual uh, and any other particular kind of formula. Uh, trigonometric ratios were also um, reasonably common. Uh, but things like um, similar triangles, uh, law of cosines and so on were, were obviously far less frequent. Um, not to say that any, a problem is necessarily easier when, when being modeled using the Pythagorean theorem, but there's, there does tend to be a rather striking lack of diversity in the kinds of formulas that students have to apply to model related rate problems um, or context referencing related rate problems, which might, um, uh, which might cause some issues. Right? If, 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 if you ask a student, for example, to, um, to compute the rate at which the tips of a, of a, of a uh, the hour and minute hand of a clock, the, compute the rate at which the distance between the hour and the minute hand of a clock is changing at exactly 9 p.m. Almost all students will attempt to use the Pythagorean theorem because at that moment, the hands make a right triangle, right? But if a student conceptualizes the situation dynamically, they'll recognize that at all other moments in the variation of the minute and hour hand, the triangle formed by those hands and the line that connects their tips is a non-right triangle and therefore requires the law of cosines to model. Uh, right? And almost it, it, the, the frequency with which related rate problems can be solved using the Pythagorean theorem makes questions like that um, very challenging for students because they assume that all or almost all problems can be, can be solved using the Pythagorean theorem. Perhaps you've noticed this if you've taught calculus. Uh, if there's ever a triangle, and it tends to happen with questions that require students to model a context using similar triangles. They will try to force the Pythagorean theorem. Um, most of the uh, related rate problem types in our data set either reference a geometric figure or ask students to compute the rate at which the distance between objects is changing. Of course, there's always variations of the standard ladder problem of the ladder sliding down the wall. Um, again, very common types of, of, of related rate problems on assessments. Uh, one of the uh, characteristics of related rate problems that increases the conceptual demand is the need for students to compute a value of some quantity to plug into the related rate formula to solve for the requested rate of change, whether it's a variable um, in the related rate formula or a variable and a rate of change, um, or some static quantity, right? Uh, uh, relatively few items required students to, uh, uh, to engage in this additional sort of algebraic step. Um, and quite a lot of questions, uh, the majority, 65% of related rate questions explicitly identified the rate of change that, uh, that, 
that students are well explicitly identified the quantity of which uh, the, the quantity whose rate of change they needed to compute. Students um, didn't always have to construct or or to identify that quantity through some type of quantitative operation or conception of the context. Okay, uh, on to optimization. Uh, similar to uh, related rates, right? here's an example of an optimization problem, again, that we, we characterize as assessing understanding, but less compellingly than some other alternatives. So here, find the maximum area of a rectangle with one corner at the origin and uh, the other corner on the graph of uh, this quadratic function in the first in, in the in the uh, uh, in the first quadrant. So I mean we know how this proceeds. Um, the the fact that students are, are maximizing area uh, immediately allows them to to identify an appropriate uh, two variable function. Um, they use the constraint that the corner is on the, uh, the graph of this function to express the area as a function of a single independent variable. And then the rest of the problem proceeds predictably. Differentiate, find the critical points, um, evaluate the area at the endpoints. Um, and if the question prompts for a justification for why the critical point identified corresponds to a maximum, they would include that this question didn't prompt for that. Okay, But again, very standard optimization problem. Um, quite different from this one. Um, if you're moving a, a ladder that's oriented horizontally around a corner, what's the longest ladder? Okay. Now, students who are uh, who immediately read this this problem might be inclined to think that they need to um, uh, to identify a critical point that corresponds to a maximum value. Right? What's the longest ladder? In fact. If conceptualized dynamically, the student would realize that the longest ladder that can move around the corner is actually the, 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 the smallest ladder that satisfies the constraint. Okay. In other words, that there is a tightest spot. And uh, if the ladder touches both walls and the corner, they can represent the length of the ladder as the sum of two, uh, two hypotenuses um, that have a common interior angle, the triangles of which have a common interior angle. Use trigonometric ratios uh, to express the length of the ladder as a function of that angle's measure, differentiate, find the critical points, and recognize that they're looking for the critical point that corresponds to a minimum of, uh, of the function L. Um, again, this is an example of a problem that that uh, requires what I referenced earlier, a dynamic conception of the context, right? Envisioning variation. And based on that conception, recognizing what quantity to express the length of the ladder in terms of, not required in the previous situation. Now, um, I'm going to address what are very common uh, concerns about, you know, that instructors express about incorporating questions like this on assessments. And I share many of these concerns, like this is too complicated and so on. Tasks you know, can be uh, reduced or scaffolded to, um, to focus on particular aspects of, of the understanding that one wants to assess. It doesn't necessarily need to require the full solution. And I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. Okay, so this question, the second optimization problem that I've just discussed here, I, I interpret to be a question that has particular novelties and nuances that require students to again make strategic decisions. And again, is an example of a question that requires students to reason covariationally uh, as, as a necessary prerequisite to the modeling uh, required. This question also avoids verbal or perceptual cues like find the, air, the maximum area. Okay. That prompt explicitly identifies the quantity students are optimizing, identifies whether a max or minimum is, 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 is needed. And the, the equation that students then construct is rather straightforward um, versus conceptualizing a situation, interpreting that situation in terms of quantities and quantitative relationships, like the angle measure identified in the latter problem uh, and so on. 
Um, linear approximation, I know that the sample task A is rather lengthy, but in contrast to sample task B, the sort of standard linearization problem where students are approximating the value of a function using the linearization at some other point, sample task A is prompting students to compute an over and an underestimate of the value of, uh, in this case, um, uh, the horizontal position of a golf ball uh, over a particular interval. And so they have to be attentive to how the concavity of the function determines whether or not their approximations are, are over or under estimates. And again, apply linearization strategically to answer the question. So again, as with the, the optimization problem, there are novelties and nuances in this problem that require students to make strategic, strategic decisions. They have to make inferences, compare the results of multiple actions. Um, and again, as I mentioned, draw inferences from the text or problem features, in this case, attend to the concavity of the function in determining whether or not their approximations are over or under estimates. Again, the, the application of linearization is not explicitly referenced. Um, and the, the, the task is sort of absent of these kinds of verbal or perceptual cues that can initiate the enactment of a rehearsed action scheme. Onto definite integrals. One of the uh, you know, very sort of standard definite integral problems. Um, uh, and again, this is, a, this is still uh, a sort of conceptually focused problem because it, it is in a context that is slightly less familiar to students in terms of uh, applications of integration. But the solution requires simply the you know, constructing the integral and evaluating it, to, you know, uh, determining the appropriate limits of integration and so on. A slight modification, slight but rather significant modification to the task statement. I apologize, I went backwards. Um, is to prompt the students to approximate the force exerted by water on a dam that's 100 feet wide and extends 50 feet underwater. That's accurate within 2,000 pounds. So this, of course, is a Riemann sum type question. They're, they're, they are generating an approximation and not an exact value. But it, in addition to attending to the algebraic and numerical uh, components of this context, as I'm indicating here in this table uh, in the top corner, there are so many other considerations that students are required to make, including um, you know, contextual, contextual uh, concerns about um, approximating a, uh, the, the, the force on a segment of the dam, quantifying error, establishing an error bound, um, improving the accuracy of the approximation by decreasing the vertical distance over which they assume that the force is constant over each strip of the dam, and then quantifying these different approximations, errors, and error bounds mathematically um, to achieve the desired degree of accuracy. So there's quite a lot involved in this modification to the question uh, in, in comparison to the previous. And this doesn't mean that all questions have to be modified in this way. It is, of course, important that students are assessed uh, that their procedural fluency is assessed with respect to applying the fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate definite integrals. Um, but the proportion of such items on assessment does demonstrate a need for considering opportunities to modify items on assessments to more meaningfully assess these kinds of understandings. So certainly a question like the one I just, uh, uh, I just uh, presented requires the, the uh, a series of actions that are specific to the targeted concept. In other words, approximating the accumulation of some quantity by constructing a, an, a, an image of how to, to construct the approximation by assuming constant, for, uh, constant force over strips of the dam and improving the approximation and, and, and representing these approximations and errors mathematically. Um, and it's, the, the, you know, the complexity of the question, particularly with respect to having to generate an approximation within a particular error bound, that requires a uh, significant interpretation. A much more basic but still meaningful uh, item from our data set uh, was the following. 
um, just given a graph of a function. Order the numerical values, or, or each of these quantities uh, re represented is, uh, is a numerical value with the function uh, it's, uh, uh, whose graph is provided. Order them from smallest to largest in terms of the numerical values they represent. Right? Now, they don't, students don't actually have to compute these values, and most of them they can't accurately compute. Um, but if they can interpret each of these quantities graphically as instantaneous rates of change, slopes of tangent lines, average rates of change, slopes of secant lines, concavity, bounded areas, or approximations of bounded areas, um, uh, using, in this instance, a left, a left Riemann sum, they can compare the value of these quantities based on a qualitative interpretation of what each of these expressions represents. So they're having to compare the result of multiple actions, particularly uh, attending to what each of these quantities represents graphically, um, and then draw inference from, in this case, a graph, um, a problem feature, a graphical interpretation of, of, of different expressions. Um, and as with the, uh, the optimization problem, this requires students to um, engage in several actions specific to the targeted concept. In other words, um, targeted concept being graphical interpretations of, of quantities uh, that represent either approximations or exact values of instantaneous rates of change um, or, or, uh, or accumulation. All right, so um, I wanna try to wrap up here because uh, I, I, I wanna certainly give time for discussion and question. Um, but I also want to acknowledge something that I'm very often up against when I design exams, midterm exams, final exams, quizzes for all of the calculus classes here at Oklahoma State. Um, it is often, uh, I, I do often experience a conflict between attempting to operationalize these features and suggestions and doing this within the constraints of summative assessments. And you know, for me, those constraints are our, our exams, our midterm exams are an hour long. Um, we have quite a lot of content to assess. We only have two midterms and one final. And so you might think that, okay, those are interesting problems, but if I put three of those on a test, half the class isn't going to finish. Uh, and that's a fair concern. And I, I again, I, I sympathize with those perspectives and I, I also have to be cognizant of that. And so I, I interpret a lot of these features of assessment items and suggestions for how to design conceptually focused assessment items or even curricular tasks um, to be most effectively implemented in the context of formative assessments, not summative assessments. So what's the distinction? Summative assessments are intended to assess students learning of ideas uh, where mastery is expected. Formative assessments um, provide an instructor an indication of students' current, current state of understanding or procedural fluency with respect to ideas that, are, that the student is still learning or developing and can have um, uh, and are intended to have implications for facilitating learning, not simply assessing it. Okay. Uh, and I've worked with my colleagues um, really since COVID uh, to design formative assessments using technology that operationalizes many of these suggestions and features of assessment items. Uh, doing that offloads some of the burden and expectation to, to incorporate highly conceptual questions or a large number of them on summative assessments, but still hold students accountable for demonstrating their understanding of important ideas. Um, and just, I'll conclude with a few examples of this. Um, so we have a current project that we're calling Dynamic Interactive Instructional Media for Calculus. And we've developed a series of um, questions that students respond to using iClicker. There's lots of different clicker, uh, you know, immediate feedback uh, uh, technologies that are available. We use iClicker. Um, we also have created a series of formative assessments within our learning management system. We use Canvas. Um, and many of them include, as I'm showing here, embedded animations that students manipulate. So they're really virtual manipulatives. And so students manipulate some sort of object that's embedded within 
um, these these quizzes um, or represented within these these uh, these slides that we we discussed during class uh, and they respond to with their clickers um, to support quantitative and co-variational reasoning. So just to take a, a quicker look at a couple of these, and then we'll uh, then I'll wrap up. And so this is just a quiz uh, on optimization, and students can uh, you know, they work on this in groups um, during class sessions. And yes, this is a, a, something that we designed for to, to assess students' learning um, when our instruction was virtual, but we've now incorporated them um, as in-class activities, and students can manipulate um, different quantities. Uh, it, it kind of explore, um, in this case, how strength varies with the dimensions of a rectangular log that's cut from a, a, a cylindrical um, or a rectangular beam that's cut from a cylindrical log and so on. Okay. Here, uh, this context was introducing related rates and focusing students' attention on uh, constant quantities, varying quantities, and relationship between the rates at which varying quantities are changing in a dynamic situation. Uh, this is a um, uh, introduction to Riemann sums that reflects that example that I presented a moment ago about um, quantifying force on a dam. Okay, so this is a series of eye clicker questions. I know that this is going very fast. This is a sped up video. But this is um, part of instruction where formative assessment questions are embedded within uh, lectures that students respond to by having to interpret um, a series of animations or visuals that are presented during, during the class. Okay. Again, an example of a, a Riemann sum situation, uh, another Canvas quiz exploring um, approximations of, of different Riemann sums, left, right, midpoint sums, um, by you know, changing the number of terms, interpreting each term in a Riemann sum as an approximation of, of an accumulated quantity over some interval of variation, uh, and then answering a series of questions about um, improving approximations um, and then expressing approximations symbolically. Similar situation where students can manipulate a, a, a dynamic applet um, to answer a series of questions about energy required to transport one kilogram of mass from the uh, surface of Earth into orbit. Okay. With the ultimate expectation being that by engaging in these series of formative assessments, students might be positioned to um, achieve what we view as sort of a high level goal of the course, which is to really understand the relationship between rate of change and accumulation expressed in the fundamental theorem of calculus. To actually construct functions that represent the continuous variation of the accumulation of a quantity and its relationship to rate of change. Uh, I and my colleagues have several um, papers describing our uh, or presenting the results of our analysis of assessment items, and I'm happy to um, to share this with anybody who is interested in reading this. Uh, or if there's any um, instructional resources or formative assessment items that anybody thinks might be of interest. Um, I'm happy to, to share those uh, also for anybody who might be teaching calculus or um, wants to talk about assessment design in either formative or summative formats. So I'll, uh, I'll wrap up there and um, see if anybody has any questions or things to discuss.